So hi, this is Quarantine Conversations number four. We're speaking with Michael Hayden uh, from the Milk and Honey uh, YouTube channel. I also know Michael uh, locally in the Nashville area. Michael, how you doing? Doing well. I do want to make a quick correction because my viewers or any of my viewers that come over and watch this are going to be a little bit confused. My okay. name is actually Hayden Michael. The Facebook that we're oh. friends over for some reason. So there's a Facebook that me and Landon are friends over and my name on there is Michael Hayden. The reason that that is is because Facebook tends to ask for my ID every few months. If it says Hayden Michael, I don't know why. I change it to Michael Hayden. Haven't dealt huh. with the problem in years. But no, That's it's okay. Odd. Whenever I... In, in the legal <laughs> system or anything like that, they always butcher my name. So it's a, it's a pretty normal thing for me. Okay. Gotcha. Um, well, today we're going to be talking about Michael's past video, God's Blind Spot. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, why do you talk so much about God if you don't believe in him, right? Yeah, People don't believe in things. They don't talk about them, right? You know what I mean? You don't believe in Santa Claus. You don't talk about Santa Claus all the time. Uh, we'll be Santa's talking about that. Your door, telling you what yeah. to do. There you go. Yeah. And uh, we're going to start off talking about the nature of mathematics and reductionism. And Michael, do you have you, or Hayden, have you um, studied anything about that? Do you have any preliminary thoughts on that? I've heard a little bit about it. It wasn't until about this morning that I looked into it after you mentioned it to me. I don't know enough okay. about the topic to say anything for now, but I'm always willing to learn more. All right, great. Um, scientism. I'm, I'm sure you've heard about scientism. Yeah. Right? The uh, accusation that scientists think everything is science. You know, you can find everything out via science. And people are, they're always going to try to discredit the fact finders, you know. So if you got something other than science, you know, to be able to accurately, reliably discover things, bring it on. You know what I mean? Exactly. I if you have a better it. method, I want to know. Uh, yeah. How I, wanna, that method I want works. a method better than the method that the whole world is built on. You know, exactly. based on its validity and efficacy. I want to know. Bring it on. Okay, so uh, regarding mathematics. So I'm going to read a quote here from um, it's a guy named Richard Carrier. Are you familiar with him? No. Okay, well, he's, a, he's a philosopher and a historian. Um, he wrote a book called uh, uh, Sense and Goodness, um, A Defense of Metaphysical Naturalism. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Basically, you think everything is the natural world, you know. And even things that you might want to call supernatural are really natural. You know, they just haven't been discovered. Or, you know, it might seem like magic, but we just yeah. don't understand it yet. Y yeah. All right. So uh, the quote goes, uh, again, by Richard Carrier, uh, mathematics is nothing more than a language, a language distinguished by its component simplicity and lack of ambiguity, a language humans created for precisely describing repeating patterns that we know can manifest out of the arrangement of matter and energy and space-time. All of mathematics can be reduced, in fact, to one single field of inquiry, geometry, the language we invented for precisely describing pattern and shape. Logic and mathematics are human creations just like English or German, and like English or German, logic and mathematics describe both real and potentially real things. Repeatable patterns of matter, energy, and time and space. What we call perception is essentially the ability to locate and distinguish patterns and the data of sensation. And recognition is the ability to identify similarities among these patterns, past and present. Now, more and more, it appears that all sociology can be reduced to psychology. All of psychology can be reduced to biology. All of biology can be reduced to chemistry. And all of chemistry can be reduced to physics, which is the study of matter and energy in space-time. Therefore, everything is matter, energy, and space-time. Society can be reduced to humans. Humans can be reduced to cells. Cells can be reduced to chemical systems, uh, which can be reduced in turn to some atomic particles. Yet that does not make this merely matter in motion. There is obviously a difference between us now and us hacked into a stew. Both contain all the same matter, but not the same pattern of arrangement, a defining element. Physical laws are the inevitable end result of, of what a universe is. What we call physical laws are not really laws, but just precise descriptions of behaviors and relationships consistently observed in nature. Did you get all that? I did get all that. <laughs> okay. There are definitely so, some parts that I uh, 
definitely agree with. I wouldn't say there's parts yeah. that I disagree with, but I definitely know that I I could not take yeah. that entire idea and spit it out in my own words. Guaranteed. Yeah, it's a very good quote. I mean, it's very very eloquent and it really you know succinctly really well thought out. Yeah. So you know you have um, a lot of scientists think that mathematics is something you find out there in the universe, and others think that it's a language, like he described. Yeah. Because you have some people that believe in God that are like, you know, God is a scientist or God is a mathematician. I mean, look at look at how the, this math, you know, these equations describe things so exactly. But I tend to agree with Mr. Carrier that you know it's a language, you know. Like English is a language. It's an accurate language, right? That describes reality accurately. And math is a, another language. And it describes reality accurately, right? Yeah. So nothing... Well, I'd say for language... I'd say that the English language doesn't really describe reality as much as it... Uh, it's it's not as good as math. It's across. not as accurate as math, maybe, right? Yeah. But pretty accurately. Yeah. Accurately enough. Yeah. For expressing That's, ideas. No. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not somebody is, is going to say, like, I, I know for sure that, that the world is only the, the material, yeah. but it sure seems that way. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, if you look at the history of science, everything that we understand has had a natural, material, mindless cause behind it. An explanation. And meanwhile, you've got these other people who claim of these outworldly things. Right. And so many of them very easily believe it. And it makes you wonder, you know, if if you can if you can tell this thing from its non-existence, how can you do that? And yet science can't. What are you using to distinguish between the two? And usually exactly. their answers always fall short whenever you put their feet to the fire in that sort of sense. All right. And, you know, faith, is that a reliable means to truth? Not at uh, all. I, I think it leads you to a million contradictory places with no way to resolve them. You know what I mean? Exactly. Unlike science, <laughs> you know, it yeah. has a it has a verified method for accurately, you know, getting things right and improving on its past, you know, uh, findings. So that was just something on my mind, um, you know, naturalism, all that. And I want to also say quickly, um, you know, people say uh, God scientists, uh, they just don't want to accept the supernatural, you know. Well, yeah. the thing is, it, it's hundreds of years of a tradition that's gone. That's that's gone in one direction, right? That's the thing. You know, if a scientist would love to find evidence of the supernatural, most of them, I've heard them say it. You know, show me good evidence for the supernatural, and let's study it. That will be a revelation. You know, exactly. Well, I just, what do uh, you have? In I was about to say, I just posted a, a video just about an hour ago. And in that, I was talking about it's not the fact that I don't want a God to exist or I don't want the supernatural to exist or I'm against the idea. It's just that mm -hmm. if that thing exists, I want to know how so that I'm not just pushing something onto the next person saying, well, right. it was explained to me this way and then just pushing mm -hmm. that on. It's like if anybody's going to prove God, I'd love to be the one to do it. If there's a yeah. supernatural out there, we want to know. Us scientism people right. aren't just like, oh, let's, let's push supernatural to the side. It's just silly. Right. It's not all about that, and people have that big misconception about uh, about skeptics and atheists, too. Yeah. There's a lot of misconceptions. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Hayden, why do you talk about God so much if you don't believe in it? I mean, and maybe you do believe in it because you talk about it all the time. Like, what's the deal? <laughs> I'm well, here's the secret. I'm secretly believing, but I'm just trying to lead people away because I get some money out of it. I knew it. But I, but I have, I have two main reasons. You okay. know, you, one of the main reasons is obviously because we deal with this on a daily basis. And I know some could say, Sorry. well, you don't have to deal with it. And I'd argue, uh, no. I mean, in the country that I live in, I definitely have to deal with it. I have to deal. Well, with when it. I leave, when I leave my 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 home, I see a church here and a church there and a church there, and constantly, you know, people going knocking on doors. We Jesus got Mormons Lord, running around. Billboards everywhere. We've got exactly. a cross on top of the on top of the courthouse downtown. Oh, hey! By the I, way, our government is run by basically theocrats. <laughs> you know, yeah, they're supposed the to day, represent so everybody, cool. but they have a certain agenda that doesn't line up with the Constitution. But I'm not going to get into too much into the Constitution, to the legal law or, or founding father thing. Uh, I have a chapter called uh, "The Problem with the uh, Theocracy" in my book. 
uh, a justified faith. And if you look on my channel, you can see um, like an audio recording of it if you want to check it out. Yeah. Actually, I kind of lay all that right here. You can kind of scroll down onto the audio chapter record. Awesome. Yeah. Got one. Excellent. Have you read it? Not the whole thing. I've read parts. Um, I'm about to be moving out of this place. I've only been here for a few months. I'm about to be out of here in a month. Everything's just, I told you a little bit about the personal <laughs> stuff right. over uh, Facebook Messenger. It's been, it's just been a wild ride the past seven to 12 months. But, gotcha. um, yeah, no, I've definitely got the copy here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a doctor, doctors talk about cancer a lot because cancer is a problem. But, exactly. you know, that's why somebody sees a problem with society and they talk about it. Um, but at least cancer exists or we can show that it we exists. We can show that it exists. Yeah. Like, people don't <laughs> understand that, like, if it doesn't exist, why does it matter to you? And yeah. other than my first answer not being... Because very... other people believe in it and they, they affect, they have an effect on, on human us. rights science yeah everything Every laws day. being passed for everybody yeah absolutely i don't know how, why that's difficult to understand really you know what i mean but it seems to be usually when they don't uh, understand that one i pull out my second reason which is ever since i was a kid i always cared about the question of god i always asked pastors questions that yeah. they'd always look down on me on i would i would have like a muslim friend in school but i'd go to sunday school at the end of the week and i'd ask hey how do we know that our god is real if they believe in another God, how do we distinguish which one's real? And it was, exactly. it always went down to faith, but I've always mm -hmm. cared about these topics, the philosophical topics, the God topics, theological, all of that. Cause I ended up moving into the occult a little bit. I was interested in mysticism. And even though I don't, I'm not an occultist or a myth, mythicist anymore or a mystic yep. or whatever people like to call themselves. Um, okay. I'm still interested in talking about it. I've got a bookshelf full of occult uh, books all yep. over the place and I still love looking through them. I just don't believe that in them anymore. That's another angle of it. If you're a person that's curious, you have intellectual curiosity about the world and the way it works. The idea of God is is a hypo an hypothesis for the world, right? Yeah. So it intersects with a lot of different subjects, you know, um, cosmology, even morality, all kinds of things. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's that's another angle to it. Uh, you know, me personally, I um. I like to stop talking about it so much, you know, I, I, I want to move on to other things, but I, and, and there's what, what typically happens is like, I'll mellow out and be like, I don't want to talk about atheism or God. And then, I, then some theists will do some crazy, you know, stuff. And yes. I get like impassioned and I'm like, you know, cause I can't help it. I care about the world. And, and I'm, I'm a person that thinks, you know, about things. So you think you know, about these things more than some Christians do. And that's that. I think, that's problematic. I think atheists and non-theists typically do. I think we know more of the bi and studies have shown that. Yes. And, it's, it, and for us, it's not really surprising. Did you see that picture I posted the other day about the comment, and it was like the Bible was written by the best American who ever lived, Jesus. Oh my God! There, there How can people be people so historically illiterate? There's, yeah. there's some people that actually think that Jesus wrote the Bible and like you have all it's funny because like, you know, of course, all Christians disagree on what the Bible means and this other thing. And it's yeah. so funny to see them finger point like, huh, can you believe these people that think that the, Jesus wrote the Bible? But then it's like, how ironic it's you crazy. think that it was written by the Holy Spirit or divinely inspired through the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes I think do those people really exist. You know, they, they do. do. They, do. Yeah, they do. We're in Tennessee. It's it's prevalent yeah. here. Um, the way I put it in my book, like, uh, I, 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 when I'm driving around and I see like a Jesus fish on the back of a car, you know, it's like a, it's like a leech on my mental body. And it's like, um, reminding me how far the world has to go to where I would want to see it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's something worth fighting for. And it's not just my prejudice. It's science. It's, it's sound philosophy. It's, um, sound ethics they're exactly. in conflict you know what i mean they're in conflict yeah, we've got problems here in the uh, legal system i mean you got that one judge from knox county who um this pastor of i think it was either a baptist church or a church of christ um mm -hmm. he was molesting his daughter molesting and raping his daughter for like four <clears throat> years came out about it and, those are common uh, stories yeah about these yeah and he got 72 years yeah. off for any of the viewers that don't know that pastor 
um, was going to be sentenced for 72 years, and the judge gave him only 12 years for being a good Christian. Uh, yeah. That should... Sending the wrong message, like, exactly. they, they should be held to a higher standard because they're entrusted with, you know, higher standards and, like, that's They're insane. the ones that claim higher morality right. in the first place, so they should have a higher standard. Held. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, Hayden, tell us about God's blind spot. What God's is that? So I was thinking one day, and so, like I said, theological and philosophical topics just interest me, whether I believe it or not. And so sometimes I'll yep. entertain the idea that a certain God or a certain philosophy is true. Mm -hmm. And I'll just see where my train of thought goes with it. And this is one of those times that I was giving the benefit of the doubt that God exists. And I was thinking, if this God of the Bible exists, mm -hmm. what could it not relate to its creation with? What is the one thing it can't relate with us with? And right. I came to the only answer. Well, there's technically a few answers, but they're basically the same thing. Um, but it boils down to faith. An all-knowing deity cannot possibly have faith um, at all. If you're all knowing, there is no room for that faith. And if that God, because some people could say, well, God knows and has faith. Right. You can't do that. Because a lot of people change it to God is all knowing as logically possible. And if you claim that, then it's bunk from that point on. Because mm -hmm. if you can have faith, he's not all knowing. But what makes this worse and a more <laughs> immoral double standard is that you've got a branch of Christianity that claims that the only way to Jesus Christ is through faith. Faith alone is not your works. There are some people that add in it's works and that, and then there's some people that actually believe it's only works. But for mm -hmm. those branch of people that think it's only faith, this is the highest, most immoral double standard you could have out there is a God who doesn't understand faith, can't relate to it, can't have it no matter how hard he tried, and right. then he's willing to torment you based on you not being able to do the thing that he can't even do himself. And so, in my opinion, Absolutely. that is God's blind spot. Yeah, I think you made a very good point. Um... You would think that God would know that belief is not voluntary. You know, exactly. you can't con you can't choose what you're convinced of. Would a God not know that, right? Exactly. <laughs> and if he if he did know that and still wanted to punish on the grounds of that, uh, that yeah. just proves how much of a monster he is. Uh, what kind of read... what kind of what kind of admirable figure not only wants but demands worship? Only exactly. tyrants. You should be Boy, the worst example think... of humanity. I don't think anybody deserves worship or anything deserves worship, but like, you it's know, true. let's just, let's soften it to reverence. You know, you have to be deserving of that. Exactly. And not ask for it. If you ask for it, it's like, you like it's that one. Because you create something. Like a, a parent creates a child, but if they're a horrible parent, they don't deserve any, any kind of praise. Do they? Exactly. What kind of parent it's is like, God? He's an absentee parent. He's a negligent parent. He's, I mean, like, okay, so you, say, say you had a, a dad that you knew existed, and uh, he left cryptic messages on, on the refrigerator for you, and I got this from somewhere, I don't remember where. You know, what would you think of that dad? He, he was never there to take care of you, but he, like, just dropped off little messages, vague and conflicting messages, and, uh, I mean, come on. That's and what totally if he made a torture you chamber in the basement for you, you know, if you didn't somehow put all the messages uh, together and follow it right, you know? Intent. Like, it's your fault now. It's a, it's a victim-blaming yeah. system at the end of the day. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And you, you made a point in your video, you know, Theus will say, um, you know, God, if God is love and hell is merely the separation from him, he's still torturing or allowing torture to an extreme degree. And so that still conflicts with... The assertion that he's yeah, a loving it's still being. torture. If you're separated yeah. from love, peace, like all those good things on that polarity, it's still torment. People like to soften it. My uh, my stepfather yeah. does this. He believes, <laughs> one time he told me, he said, uh, well, I don't believe in a literal hell. I just believe it's separation from God. And then right. I said to him, well, what's the problem with that? <laughs> because God would be responsible for everything. You know, he, if he's all knowing, all powerful, and he, he knew everything. So he how, do, how do you, not, he created the devil, I guess. And he allows him to do what he does if he exists. So, you know, exactly. and how he, many people have killed have killed for the cause of the devil compared to God? Ten. And the name and of the devil, and the name told of Satan, him. I'm going to go on a crusade and, and 
kill all these people. Not nah, that that's never happened. <laughs> exactly. So that that's a curious fact. I think I think it's um, Job's family is like the only people that the devil killed, and it's only because God told him to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, I, I, brought, I brought this up. Do what? What's that? I was gonna say I'll bring that up to people. I'll because uh, I like the way that Matt Delahunty phrases the question of how did you know that God's the good guy and the devil's the bad guy. And right. usually, instead of asking that, I'll say, how do we discern, because a lot of Christians down here love that word, I'm like, how do we discern between a good guy and a bad guy? And they'll always go on to, it's about their works. They move out of a faith parameter completely, and it's all about works. And so when you mention how many times God has commanded the decapitation of people just so that he can take a chill pill, the killing, murdering, raping, and kidnapping, and enslaving of all kinds of people— and yet the devil only killed 10, and it's because God told them to. And I ask them, so does that mean that God's the bad guy? And they say, no. And I ask, how do you know that? And they say, well, God's got a good reason for it. It's the craziest right. thing. And I can't, I, it's, it's so hard to get around that for them because they only bring up that rebuttal because there's, there's nothing left. They've, they've hit a block in their own mind. So even if you can get around it, if the goal is to help them and to change their mind, it's not going to work at that point. You aren't the person right. to do it. And I've learned honestly to just stop talking at that point because someone else might do it for them or they might sit alone and think about it. And they'll be like, you know what? They were right about this one thing. Cause I mean, that's one of the ways that I changed my mind was listening to atheist talk. And then after going to work and thinking about it, I was like, you know, that is a good point. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with it. And, and so many slowly, people are not exposed to, to so many arguments and facts. You know, exactly. Just never That's thought about. To do what I do. Because I know I didn't. You know, before like eight years ago or so, I, I never thought. I never knew. I never thought to ask certain questions. You know, so definitely. Hayden, um, can you tell me how a, a a human or a blood sacrifice can solve anything? How that makes sense? Apparently, apparently, a blood sacrifice of an innocent person can make up the immorality and sins of an entire civilization not only that but generations to come yeah. i don't understand how that is the way that it is but i can tell you when i was a christian the way that it made sense to me was that you know you've got abraham who's willing to sacrifice his own son not only that god's got to one up him he's like you know i'm divine i'm already above you so i'm going to send not only my son but myself to die which mm -hmm isn't really a sacrifice but when you're when you're a christian you don't think about that you think well, of, he, di he didn't stay dead there are people that have sacrificed yeah. their only lives for uh, uh you know for other people jesus like you know he had a bad weekend you know at the end of the day who, yeah because now who, he's who just wouldn't do that deal right to save the, the world but the world's still not saved though that, these That's problems are are continuous you know they uh so, um, Hayden, what do you think about capital punishment? Capital punishment. Have you thought much about that topic? I have. Um, so I'll tell you, for like 95% of my life, I've been against capital punishment. Okay. I, I'm never really for it. And only times that I'm <laughs> for it is like, that's why I'd say it's like a 95 to 5%, you know, mm -hmm. like the worst of the worst, like Hitler level people, you know, I think, you know what? Let's let's get them out of here. But then at right. the end of the day, there's there's some controversy because also it costs a lot of money to get it done. You've got ethical reasons as well. But for for the most part, I'm against it. I'm against um, honestly taking the life of another, no matter how bad they are. Yeah. What we can do is we can use their life to better everyone else's. We can get them to work for us. I mean, there's been yeah. times where the CIA hires people who are serial killers and they're like hey you're gonna help us find all these other people that are also kill i think what was that ted bundy as well did ted bundy help the cia w with um solving no, man i haven't really read too much about ted bundy to, to be honest with Damn. you um but this well, does I do remind know that me they of, do that oh, and so there's a way about of psychopaths real quick why it's on my mind um yeah. if i can remember the quote um the impossibility of eternal invulnerability creates an incentive for even the callous sociopath to re-enter the round table of morality. So that, I mean, I think that's Pinker. Um, so it, that's just a good thing about morality, you know, logically how we, as, as social beings, you know, we're not in, eternally invincible. So even a sociopath or a psychopath who can't feel even, maybe they have their amygdala, 
messed up the you know the the, the center of the brain that you know has empathy and things yeah, like they that have a t- they have a tumor that's like right messing which it, up. It, it turns out to be a pretty frequent um case uh, even they can logically understand that argument that we're all interconnected we're all you know this goes back and forth you know so yeah. go ahead hayden sorry i just had a but uh, I do know I do know that they do use people to um, end up saving other people. Like, hey, what were the methods and how how did you do it? I right. mean, it's it's the balance between crime and justice. I think it's a beautiful thing at the end of the day. But my main position on it is not to kill people. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like infinite punishment for a finite crime because I believe that this is the only life we have. Killing somebody <laughs> that's an infinite punishment at the end of the day. Um, I think and also a lot of people them. can change, but yeah. not. Yeah. But that's the thing. Sometimes, and I'm not trying to stick up for pedophiles or anything because we don't just right. kill murderers and pedophiles. I mean, we they've killed people who just robbed stores before or robbed right. a, a high amount of dollar value or whatever, whether it's a museum or something like that. And so it, it definitely there definitely is a gray zone, but for the most part, I'm not for capital punishment. Okay. Well, what I wrote about capital punishment is uh, it dehumanizes those who implement and witness it. Um, it risks wrongly killing the innocent. Uh, it's questionable as a deterrent. It's based on primitive vengeance and not reform, protection, uh, prevention, and understanding slash bettering mental and societal defects. Um, it may feel right for those who clearly deserve it, but is it the right path? It also costs just as much uh, financially. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of truth to... Um, you know, an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, absolutely. And, you know, not the thing about not punishing, you know, the, the, the point of the judicial system is not to uh, punish people that primitive, it's you know, correct. I want to, you know, it's understandable, the natural feeling, but you want to reform them and you want to protect society, you know, we would lock up tornadoes if we could. They, you know, people have to be locked up that are dangerous. You know what I mean? Um, but if we can correct it, yeah, they can become exactly. a valuable part of society. And exactly. And there is a quote from uh, Bertrand Russell that I really like about this. Um, so you know Bertrand Russell, right? Yeah, the English philosopher. Yeah, he, wonderful writer. Um, so he said about this. He said, "I wish to suggest that." Um, we should treat the criminal uh, as we treat a man suffering from plague. Each is a public danger. Each must have his liberty curtailed until he has ceased to be a danger. But the man suffering from a plague is an object of sympathy and commiseration, whereas the criminal is an object of extrication. This is quite irrational, and it is because of this difference of attitude that our prisons are so much uh, less successful in curing criminal tendencies than our hospitals are in curing disease. And I think that's... Exactly. A lot of validity. To, to I mean, that, there's a lot of I mean? people that are in and out of prison because the system is flawed to begin with. You've got right. uh, nine nonviolent offenders going in for hell four to six months, and because they're with the violent offenders, with rapists and murderers and people like that, it doesn't right. it doesn't soften the hard people. What it does is it hardens <laughs> up the soft people, and then after six no. months they get out, and something happens and they end up right back in prison. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had they been in their selective. You could say tears, I guess, but the problem is mm-hmm. they're, they're just throwing everybody into the bunch, and it's not a good system at the end of the day. Right. Uh, well, Hayden, what is your response to people that say, you know, your morality is still based on Christianity, that you're still a, a cultural Christian? What would you say to that? Um, I'd say that they're wrong. Um, <laughs> I mean, it just takes reading maybe five pages. You could pick five pages yeah, out yeah. of the Bible right now to know yeah. that that's absolutely not true. I mean— yeah, let's stone your children for being unruly. Right. Stepfathers are looked at in, <laughs> inferior, inferiorly. You look at the Ten Commandments. So the Western world is not based on the Ten Commandments. You know, the first one is Only you shall have no other god, and like the death penalty is for for worshiping other gods. Like our laws are exactly the opposite of that. Thank yep. goodness for that. <laughs> have you read Have you read the Founding Myth by Andrew Seidel? I just oh got yeah. This book. About yes, a it's month very ago. Good. I haven't had the chance to read it. And I missed I, yes, and I missed getting it signed last year. He was at uh some university, I forget, and I was gonna go, but I didn't get to. It's a very Damn. good book. You'll enjoy it. Very, very good. And this is a topic I have read a lot in about you know the founding fathers. 
I have an entire book with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, everything they ever wrote, because their letters are like full of like insults to Christianity and and people that are clearly free thinkers and products of the of the uh, Enlightenment. And yeah. then because you've got a lot of pretty, history in your Justified Faith book, and history is always I'm been a big history guy. Topic. Yeah, uh, what's your worst topic? Yep. So okay. I'm definitely trying to look more into that now. Well, it matters process. because you don't if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. You have to know where you came from to get a bearing on where you're going. You know what I mean? It's like if you forgot the last 20 years of your life. Every, it's like every 20 yeah. years you're going to forget the last 20. You're going to make those same it, mistakes that you made as a teenager yeah. all over again. If you didn't know about the Nazis, you might be tempted to slide into that, you know, without seeing it coming. Something like that. So, you're like, we've made this what mistake. I to, right. So what I say to people is... um. You know, I reject Christianity's metaphysical claims. Um, I'm against basing life on faith, authority, or blind obedience. I'm against human sacrifice and deeply against the whole idea of hell. I find cannibalistic and vampiristic rituals distasteful. I think condemning innocent descendants immoral. I'm not okay with slavery or misogyny. I don't believe in rendering unto Caesar no matter what or that Caesars have been placed on earth by God. I'm not for murdering heretics or hating or abandoning, fam abandoning family if they believe differently. I don't think it's wise. <clears throat> more healthy to preach the imminent end of the world. And I'm for teaching, uh, hey, microorganisms as the cause of sickness, not demons. And I think the existence of exorcists is comically horrific. Um, you sound like I don't Jesus. Think... <laughs> That's what a lot of people say when, like, you have good morals. They'll be like, oh, you you would yeah. be a tr If you were a believer, you'd be the best Christian. And it's like, and I get I those comments a lot. I don't think rape victims should marry their rapists. And I'm for investigation, not revelation. So, exactly. No, that doesn't work. And um, when Christianity ruled the world, you know, it was the Dark Ages. We didn't have all these concepts, philosophical, secular concepts that we got with the Enlightenment and things like that. Um, Hayden, what do you think about the Garden of Eden story? I know. So there's there's your typical Garden of Eden from like Genesis. And then when you start looking into like Golden Dawn occultism, imagine the the Garden of Eden story that we mainly know being like a P on uh -huh. a football field. The Golden Dawn takes it five football fields. What is like the Golden down the Dawn? Because I've read a lot about you know I've read Joseph Campbell if you're familiar with him, and a lot of like you know comparative religion and and yeah. you know things like that. What is what is the book that you're referring to? Because I'm not familiar so with it. They have there's many books. I mean there's different authors. Like I was a big fan of Israel Regardi. Um, he wasn't he wasn't an actual like real initiate of the Golden Dawn, but he mm -hmm. he basically took the torch and led it to where it is today. And then it splits off into these other people like David Griffin, uh, Chick and Tabitha Cicero. And uh, people argue all about that, just like religion. But the Golden Dawn right. was a fraternity that started in London, I think, 1888. And it was started by a guy named McGregor Mathers, who had knowledge from these three secret chiefs. There's always something higher that nobody else can test that uh -huh. starts usually these sort of things. And what's funny yeah. is, I don't know if you know about Aleister Crowley. Yeah. But I Aleister do. Crowley ended up founding uh, Thelema. Now, right. before he founded Thelema, he basically got ushered into the golden dawn and there was a bunch of people that were mad about it because he didn't have to go through the ranks like normal people did um, right. he had a lot of knowledge already so they were like we need to pull this guy in and so it gets to the point that alistair crowley <laughs> is like hey the uh, the three secret chiefs uh told me that uh i'm the big boy in town mcgregor mathers i'm, I'm taking over and of course Mathers was like, no, this isn't okay. And so you've got these two people fighting over the same, well, I have a girlfriend that goes to a different school, but she's my girlfriend. And the other one's like, no, she's my girlfriend. And so you've got that going <laughs> on over and over. And and it was just a down trickle from there. But basically the Golden Dawn has uh, hermetic teachings within it. It's a mixture of like Egyptian, uh, Judeo-Christian philosophy, which mm. I don't think, I, I think Judeo-Christian is just a made up term. It but, is. It yeah. didn't used to exist, you know. Uh, Christians uh, persecuted Jews for like you know thousand ye thousands of years, and, uh, and now they you know, want they to made them, in because it's they put them in ghettos. Family. They made they made tags to identify them. They they accused them of like drinking infant blood, the uh, blood libel of Christians, uh, poisoning um, wells, and and all kinds of crap. So <laughs> Nazis yeah. didn't didn't you know they took over from that that anti-Semitism, but uh, you know. Um, we know about the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, and uh, 
the kind of the, the Garden of Eden story is kind of like a kind of the Jewish um, take on that. It's not original to the Bible. Yeah. Do you know about the Epic of Gilgamesh? It's like a little a, bit. Uh, it's said that it's the um, the earliest Western literature, like the first epic, and uh, the flood story comes directly from it. There's like a version in that um, story, and that story is like two thousand years older than the Bible, the earliest parts of the Bible. And we have it like on you know, a lot of tablets. people copy it and they think it gives it validity to the fact or yeah. to their fact. Well, the Jews they, they even happened. redid stuff like they changed like the meaning of things and the and the message of the myth and things like that. But yeah, there's a lot of work on that that this has been done that we didn't know about before, like because we couldn't read like these um tablets and like uh I think it's cuneiform that um it's written in cuneiform script. So yeah, yeah. I know you I know you said you're not a big history guy, but this stuff will really enrich um. I like to use the uh, the metaphor when you learn about history and science and 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 in, learn in general. It's like um, seeing the world in HD instead of SD in standard definition, because yeah. you see all these connections. Like uh, there's all these connecting stories behind even mundane things, um, so everything is richer. You know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely uh, have been getting more interested in that since then. But yeah. uh, to to go back before we trail off too hard to answer your question on how I feel about the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Um, there's something that I, I don't hear that's said that much that was uh, brought before me a couple weeks ago. Okay. And so you've got the whole Garden of Eden situation, Adam and Eve eating, uh, or they, yeah, they do both eat the the fruit. But the Mark. thing is, is that Eve got tempted by the snake, the 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 worst, talking snake, the best deceiver yeah. of all. Yeah, yeah. It, he was the king of lies. Like you know, you and me can be scammed easily. We're we're all deceived, and so Eve is deceived. Right. By the highest deceiver of all time. She goes to Adam, doesn't even have to sales pitch him. She's just like, hey, eat this fruit. And he's like, oh, fuck it. And somehow Adam and Eve are both first punch, uh, punished. Women are punished more. And what, what oh, should yeah. have happened, if you're going to punish all of them, the snake should have been punished first, then Adam, then Eve. But what you have is women on the, are on the lowest tier, then man. Yeah. And the snake is just like, oh, you just get to slither on your belly, which Satan isn't even in every snake now. So God just punished. He's not necessarily Satan either. This yeah. is in the epic. Because you've got Lucifer, snake. Satan, and then the devil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of and, like you know, um, question, question. Um, when God placed the tree of knowledge in the middle of the garden, did he know what would happen? If he did, he set us up for failure. If he didn't, he's not all-knowing. So which is it? Because you think an all-knowing yeah. being, he knows what's going to happen, right? Well, I'll, tell, like I'll how, tell you what my grandmother would say to that. Mistake she would suing up if he's perfect and knows everything. She would say that he either did know, or he, you know, the whole he's testing us, and you should obey regardless. And I'll usually bring up the whole if you, wolf. If we haven't eaten the fruit, then they don't know right from wrong until they eat of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. And she's like, "Well, no, you obey because you obey." Right. And so you get people, and they'll just get into that corner. But yeah, it, he's either not all knowing or he knew what would happen and was like, you yeah. know what? Screw it. We'll go through it. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with Bart Ehrman, who's a biblical scholar? He wrote uh, Misquoting Jesus and uh, a whole bunch of books about he's an I think agnostic. I saw him speaking at some okay. university, but it's just right. like one video of his. Well, he has a book called um, God's Problem, and it talks about suffering. Uh, and he, he goes through the Bible, and he points out how there are different reasons for suffering in the Bible. Like in the Old Testament, the prophetic version, the, the prophets, they give a different reason for suffering than the other people in the Bible. So there's like conflicting um, explanations of why there's suffering in the Bible. So even that is contradictory. <laughs> so like, I think it's, um, I think the apocalyptic um, writers, they said, uh, this is all a test and God is going to make all better. And then others said it's a punishment. It can't be a punishment and a test, right? No. But there's all kinds of different explanations you, like you that. You punish somebody technically after a test. Like, let's say if I was giving you a test of 10 mathematical questions and I was going to let you know, like, hey, if you get these right, we're going to go out for ice cream. And if you get them wrong, you're going to have to sit in the corner for 10 minutes. I can't. Right. I guess you could punish somebody with a test like you know a kid that doesn't want to take a test but yeah. for this situational thing with god he can't be giving you a test and a punishment at the same time it is right, either right. one or if not neither yeah. but this Plus is on adam the grounds that he exists and is doing things right 
Yeah, and we're we're engaging with theists based on what they say, and we're speaking hypothetically. You know, okay, let's look at what you, what you put on the table and what you're um, asserting and, and examine it. We're not saying, oh, we you know we agree with that or we think it's real, and we can talk about things and entertain ideas without believing in them. I think that's a quote from uh, uh, Aristotle, like a mark of an educated mind is somebody that can entertain an opinion without subscribing to it. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, that's another great uh, quote of Shakespeare. Uh, Great minds talk about people like gossip. I'm sorry, small minds talk about people like gossip, and great minds talk about ideas. Yeah, I think there's a lot of validity to that, and I think a whole lot of people love this stuff. In the case that they kind of have small minds, I guess. But um, yeah, yeah. I had more to say about the the Garden of Eden. This, I mean, there's all kinds of holes in it. If I can find oh, yeah. my notes here on that you're basically a, a parent putting a gun in front of a child and then punishing them when they actually shoot a bullet through the wall or their own leg right yeah well you know um adam and eve you know what does it mean to punish them when they don't have the knowledge of good and evil they don't when, when you say don't do this they, they don't they don't know anything right so Not like um they what kind of the fruit right and what kind of god would forbid his creatures to know the difference between good and evil, you know? One that wants to keep them in ignorance. And exactly. another weird thing about the Garden of Eden story is, and I can never get a good answer out of Christians, because even back when I was a theist, I did not understand this little part. Yeah. And you know how when they ate the fruit, they looked down and realized that they were naked. Like it was, I don't think it said that it was a sin, but it was just, a, it was a dirty thing. It wasn't good. Right. Um, and so if that was not a good thing, and morality in God's eyes never ch- it's always the same. He doesn't change morality. They always claim this. Right. Why the hell did he put them in the Garden of Eden naked in the first place? When everything was perfect, he still put them there naked. It it raises right. a lot of questions. I mean it <clears throat> it's just yeah. contradictory. Also, um, how could a just God punish it, punish innocent descendant innocent descendants? Um, and for the crime of pursuing knowledge, you know, w- which is the lifeblood of progress, exactly. uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, that's not something that's admirable. Um, it's like my grandfather getting in a car wreck and or he gets a DUI and then I'm not allowed to drive for the rest of my life because of it. Right. It's like punishing the descendants of somebody. Right. And does the story kind of celebrate ignorance and misogyny, you know, and, you know, the misogyny well, on died. Yeah, thy thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee, from Genesis. Yeah. Um, if God was able to make a heaven somewhere else, why couldn't he have made this world a heaven? Why the, the in-between, the waiting room? Because man screwed it up for him. <laughs> oh. but he's God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> me me um, and my buddy, we like to uh, make the analogy free will, God... do you have free will in heaven? Because that's often an, an excuse for things here. Technically, it, it, that can't yes. excuse like you know hurricanes, but it can't excuse maybe people. But yeah. is there free will in heaven? Or are you just an automaton? I think. No. How do you find bliss being on bended knee forever? Why, while to a master on bended knee period forever? How's that blissful? But to a master that's burning people ever, good people you know, in and Isaiah and possibly loved says, ones. You're gonna be happy to heaven. And he's talking about, I think it's like, it's Isaiah 66. It's somewhere in there. I know that. And yeah. uh, it's talking about how like in heaven, what you'll do is you'll go and walk without the camp or like outside of the gates or something like that. And you'll get to look at the dead corpses being eaten by worms of those who have transgressed and don't believe in God, like those who ended up in hell. And it's like, how does anybody think that this is going to be a cool place to go to? Like, yay, can't wait to go to like heaven and go look yeah. at my dead aunt because she didn't believe and she told a few lies and smoked a cigarette one time. Like, it's... And people it's think it's so supernatural. Uh, that two brothers are, that ride around killing demons and stuff. You heard of that show? Yeah, I love that show. Yeah, it, it was actually... Um, I can't remember the guy's name. Kripke, who created it. Uh, he was a humanist. And he, uh, I remember like uh, one scene in season four, I think, Dean was like in this waiting room and they were like offering him to go to heaven and, and stuff. And he's like, you know, I, it, it's all about people. It's all about, you know, family. It's all about, you know, people. You know, that's what matters. Um, and he yeah. said, I don't want to be a Stepford bitch in paradise or something like that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I love how in that show that the, I don't know how far you got into the series because I think I'm the all last... the way got up. 
I stopped okay. watching it for like two or three years, but yeah, I, I've caught up. Yeah. I watched 12 or 13, and then I stopped after that, and I think I need to catch up on the new one. But I love how the last show has the now. angels as dicks and the demons, yeah. like the cool people. God, oh, oh, the last season, God is the is the main villain. They're trying to kill God. But yeah, oh, he, I cannot wait to dick. see that. You know, God was the the writer. Um, Chuck, he was like a comic book writer, right? Yeah, he turned out to be God, and yeah, he's yeah, like there a was like the gospel dick. of Winchester yeah. going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's God, and they're trying to kill him. He's the main bad guy, so what? it's pretty cool. The last time, uh, last time. I was watching it. Chuck left off with uh, was it Eve or Sarah? I don't know. It was like his sister. Or so something many seasons, like man. I, I'm not sure. It's, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, more points about the Garden of Eden. Um, we also have like the the evidence of all of biology, history, archaeology that conflict with that story. Um, and uh, geology. Um, and also biblical um, criticism, they have uh, they found out like um, there's multiple authors in Genesis. So like um, you can tell by the style that they're writing um, and the way the name they call God by that these are different authors. So um, you have like they call them the, like the J author, the P author, I forget some other letter author, and uh, you can tell that these that these just splice together, you know, stories that have different kind of messages even and style and call god different names and um that forget about it it's a plagiarism of an earlier culture you know the within the uh, jewish culture these guys it's different writers and, and somebody later put them together they think in like the babylonian exile um yeah. so and also like they talk about like donkeys roaming around the the middle east um but we know that there were not domesticated donkeys until like way later so that's another like you know, tell that this is a later yeah. thing that people cobbled together. Um, yeah, and you know, Genesis one and two, they duplicate. There's two different yeah, they creations. Repeat or, themselves in a way. They're contradictory, like mm -hmm. order and stuff. And you know, the order in Genesis is like the completely out of whack from what we know from science. You know, what's created first and and, and all that. I think How God can you have a day or stars or something. If there's no yeah. rotation. Exactly. The Earth isn't rotating. I think until technically, you could hypothetically agree that it's. I think it's not until the fourth day that the Earth would be turning because there's no sun yet. There's no night, day, light, and dark. So, like, I don't understand how there could even be a first day, second day, third day, unless right. it, it's just at the end of the day, it reads like a myth. Like any any Christian or any believer, whether you're Muslim or anything, they can read their myth and it's oh that sounds about right. But all the other ones. They can definitely see what we mean by, yeah, this reads like a myth and doesn't seem right. so. And, and it sounds right if everybody around you believes it and you've been taught to believe it since you were a kid before you exactly. had developed your reason. And, you know, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, well, Hayden, man, I've loved having you on today. And we're at uh, 47 minutes. Um, I think oh, we wow. might do a do a collaboration of some kind in, in the future. Um, definitely. So, and people check out his video. Uh, I mean, his... Uh, YouTube channel, uh, Milk and Honey. It's a it's a pretty cool site. It's got it's kind of diverse videos um, about these kind of topics and other like pseudo pseudoscience and some things like that. It's a little uh, all over so the place. Sometimes. Check that out. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, well, thank you for coming on, Hayden. Thank um, you for having me. Uh, absolutely, and we'll talk soon. All right, I'll see you. Have a good day. Right, peace out.